Martin Luther King Jr., he said that the arm of the universe is long, but it is bent toward justice. And the idea being that it may take a long time for justice to come about, but it will come about. I've enjoyed watching a TV program now for several years. I still haven't finished it all, so please don't tell me any spoilers on it yet. It's called Once Upon a Time, and uh, it's the story of uh, uh, it's a Disney show, and they put all, together all these different fairy tales together, and they give a little different twist on each one of them. It's kind of neat little show uh, to watch. It's a recurring theme among those heroes is that good will always win. And there was this one episode where the little boy, he's, he's probably the most hopeful, the most always believing that idea that good's going to win in the end. Uh, he gets downhearted. And he looks up at one of the other characters and he says, No, good loses. Good always loses, he says, because good has to play by the rules. Evil doesn't. Isn't that the way you felt? Have you ever felt that way? Yeah, the, 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 the bad guy wins, the one who is wrong wins. We see evil ones profiting off of others' suffering. We get downhearted about all these things. We see evil flourishing in the world around us. It seems like all of society is just bound up and went to hell and is happy to go there today, right? Yet, yet, we know that that's not the end. Are you the kind of person who believes that good always wins? Or are you the kind of person that believes that good loses? Well, folks, I, I want to give you a little bit of encouragement today and maybe a little bit of warning as well. The inerrant scripture says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen. Paul is talking to the Galatians church here and he's encouraging them, don't be weary in doing the right thing. Don't be weary in doing good. Don't be weary in doing the right doctrine. Don't be weary in all of these things because in due season we're going to reap, meaning there's going to be a great harvest out there someday. But that someday ain't yet. But he also tells us, he warns us to faint not. Now, it's not the idea of fainting, you know, where people just fall backwards and then they faint. The idea here is not to give up. Don't give up yet. There's a modern term today called deconstruction. And you might call it those who are fainting in the modern hour. Deconstruction. It's being used of high-profile Christians, people who are in the public eye, uh, been in public eyes of Christian for several years, to signal that they are now rejecting the traditional Christian faith. You might think this is a small thing, but we see it all over the place. They claim that they have questions that they can't answer from Scripture or no one else can answer their questions. Yet the answers are right there. They're just not willing to accept them many times. <clears throat> they usually mean they've adopted the worldview of today. That The things they taught once before on gender, on salvation, on sin, on hell, and all these other issues, they want to deny and self-decide. Why? Because popular culture doesn't like those ideas today, do they? John Piper's son, this is, this is horrifying. I can't imagine anything more horrifying. John Piper, uh, a famous pastor, Baptist pastor. Um, John Piper, his son, Abraham Piper, actually has a TikTok channel where he tries not to preach the gospel, but to get people to deny the gospel. He tears down the gospel week after week through little videos that he will share. He's actually preaching an anti-gospel. What a horrible thing that his son denied the faith in that way. Some of y'all heard of Hawk Nelson, the Christian rock group. One of the guys there, John Steingart, he denied the faith, says he rejects the traditional Christian faith now. He doesn't believe anymore. I wonder if they ever believed at all. I'll be honest with you. Joshua Harris, uh, a guy who back in 1990s, he, he come out, he was a single guy, and he wrote this book called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. He encouraged young people to seek purity in their lives by what the Scripture says. Fast forward 
to today, he put something on Instagram denying all his teaching on Christian purity. Said he was wrong about all these things. Says he is sorry for contributing to a culture of exclusion and bigotry. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad to deny the faith? Probably the worst one that really disturbed me was a group called DC Talk. Y'all remember them? There's, uh, there were three guys, uh, Toby Mack, Michael Tate. But the third guy, Kevin Max, for the other two, I, I, I understand they're still strong Christians. But this guy, he put this out on Twitter, the third fella who hadn't done as well for himself. He writes, I've been deconstructing, reconstructing, progressing, whatever you wish to call it for decades. I've been in the outsider misfit seeker club for a long time now. Thank you for welcoming me in, but I've always been there. With a tweet he followed up after that that said, Hello, my name is Kevin Max and I'm a hashtag ex-evangelical. But how sad that this person would deny the faith at such a time as this. Now he says he's not really denying the faith. He says now he follows the universal Christ. Whatever that's supposed to mean, right? And a lyric to one of his newer songs says this, I don't think the God that I believe in is just all of a sudden going to ignore me because I don't believe every single thing that's written down somewhere. It's the book, isn't it? They don't like this book. They try to rewrite this book. They try to cut this book apart. They try to turn, burn this book. But my God has told me that he'll preserve it to every generation, right? This book ain't going away. This book decides what is right and wrong. This book decides what is good and evil. This old book. And they've decided they're going to decide what's good and evil. As many a people have tried that over the years, haven't they? With terrible results coming from it. While well, I look at the world that tends to lean towards choosing evil, we all have it built into us, I really believe, if you're sitting here and you're honest with yourself, you know there's going to be a payday someday. I tend to read authors and others from before my time. There was a preacher named R.G. Lee. He preached a message so long ago called Payday Someday. He preached it over and over again. All these people come to Christ by hearing this message about a payday someday. Now, he began by introducing the characters to the story that I want to tell you about in this payday someday. And that is found in 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. If you'll turn over there in your Bibles right now, 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. And while you're turning the pages and finding your way over there, I want to begin by introducing the four characters to this story as well. Now, the first character is a man named Naboth. Naboth owns a vineyard right next to this evil king of Israel who has been tormenting Israel for, for many years. We know him as Ahab, right? Well, at, Naboth wants to walk the old paths and serve God. God told him back in the Old Testament that he is supposed to pass his land on to the next generation and not to sell it, not to get rid of it, to pass it on. So Naboth has that in his heart. That's very important to our story here today. Not only is there Naboth, the other one in this cast of characters I want to talk with you about is Ahab. He is an evil king who is leading his people to worship Baal, literally the devil more or less, and to worship him instead of Jehovah, all on the pretense of pleasing his evil wife. Now his evil wife, you may never read about her in scripture, but I bet you've heard some uh, $2 woman down the street called her name before. Her name is Jezebel. And she is probably one of the most wicked women in all of Scripture. She was a woman so nitwicked that no one I know of has ever named their daughter after her today. Her name is synonymous with evil. And she was a, a king's daughter. And she led all of Israel in, here into this devil Baal worship. Finally, in the cast of characters here in the story I want to tell you today, is a man named Elijah. Elijah. Y'all have gotten to know him over the past several messages. He is a prophet of God who has went in training at this point in time, training others to carry on the mission. And uh, he's kind of been hiding for a long time, but God's going to bring him out of retirement by the end of the story that I want to tell you here today. First of all, let's see what it says here in chapter 21, verse 1 through 4. It says, It came to pass after these things that Naboth, remember him, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel. 
hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give it thee for a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into the house heavy, displeased, because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed. Isn't that precious? Laid down upon his bed, turned away his face, and would eat no bread. Oh, how sad. Oh, how sad for old Ahab. See, Ahab wanted this vineyard right next to his home. He noticed that things seemed to grow better over there in old Naboth's vineyard. My, how he would like to go over there and eat some of the fruit that was coming from over there. But he didn't have that. He was a king over all of Israel. But he couldn't get this one little vineyard that was right next to him. And it was all being denied him because of religious reasons. Because Jehovah God had said not to sell the land, but to keep it within your family. Now Ahab went home, and you'll notice here, he whines over it like a little child, doesn't he? I mean, I'd be ashamed as a man to get down and whine and cry and lay in the bed and not eat because they won't give me something like that, right? Have you ever noticed how people who seem to have everything are still unsatisfied? you ever noticed that? Now, now here's the thing. It seems today there is no shame in covetousness. There is no shame in having to have everything. There's no shame in all of that. It's almost expected, well, I really want it. You know, and, and a grown man to sit and whine and cry over this, this thing. My grandpa had a saying. It was um, kind of known here in the South. He said, you're old enough, well, you want won't hurt you. And when I was young, I'd sit around and I'd think, what in the world does that mean? You're old enough, well, you want won't won't hurt you. Well, I finally figured it out over a few years what that meant. It means you're mature enough now to have good judgment. Now, people who have been given everything, and folks, I tell you what, in the culture we're living in today and the generations that have rose up, they ain't had to work for nothing. They've been given everything, haven't they? You know what happens with a child when that's been done? They never mature. They never grow up. They never realize the value of anything. They never realize what, what anything's worth. They never realize that they don't have to have everything. You don't have to have everything to be happy. You don't have to have everything. But evil always wants more. So we don't cut that in there, do we? That that desire to covet and that desire to want everything, it's evil, okay? It's evil to always want what everybody else has got. It's evil. It's not just bad. That's evil. That's the tenth commandment. Thou shalt not covet. You hear we see it rolling around in a way Ahab's heart here. Enter Miss Jezebel. Look here at verse 5. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered and said, I will not give thee my vineyard. Now, first of all, I want to make it clear. There was nothing wrong with him going over and asking him, Can you give this to me? Can I buy this? Nothing wrong with that. But this covetousness, when he sees that he will not give it to him, there's the problem. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou not govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them, and sealed them, and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city, dwelling with Naboth. Now there are some people who are, are led to evil, while others literally bathe in evil. And that's Miss Jezebel here. Ahab was always just a pawn to his wife. She's the one who controlled the kingdom. She was a wicked woman who would do anything to get her away in the matter, no matter what. Listen to the arrogance she had when she looked at him and she said, Dost thou not govern the kingdom of Israel? Aren't you the king? You don't have any rules. 
There's nothing that keeps you from getting whatever you want, right? So she goes up and takes and writes it in his own hand. Does that put him out of any guilt in this matter because she went and wrote it down for him? No, it does not, does it? Amen. Not at all. There's no difference in, in one writing it down or the other one writing it down. She mocked him for doing the right thing. And all that matters is this old gal is power. Now Jezebel's going to write this letter. And she's going to have this fast for the nation. And it's kind of a joke, really, because she cares nothing about Jehovah God. But she's going to have this fast for all the nation. And then she's going to put Naboth in front of the people. And two men are going to accuse him of blasphemy against God and the king. Then the crowd is going to rise up because they think he's done this. And this is her plan. They'll stone him. And they'll stone his children. And there won't be anybody to take that old land anymore. And then the king can come in and get his little bit of land that he wants. And he can eat his little bit of fruit off that land that he desires so much. Right? It only takes the blood of these good people. Now how could be this woman be so heartless wanting power over everything like this? A lot of people want that. They want power. They want control. They want to have to control the situation no matter what. How do people get like this? Well, if you listen to our modern psychologists, they tell us this. They say the main reason for controlling of the people is to protect oneself from helplessness and feeling insignificant is what they say. And the control issues, they say, are often embedded in childhood when a person grows up with toxic parents. And there's a little bit of truth in all of that. But here's the truth of the matter. You can't blame your parents for how you are. Amen. All right? Amen. A lot of people lean in on that. I've seen many of these talk shows in the, in the afternoon. Well, it's their parents' fault. It's why they're like this. Well, they may, parents may have got them in a bad situation. They may have had some toxic parents who, who gave them some trouble. But my friend, you are responsible for what you do with your life. You're responsible for your evil choices. Now, Jezebel absolutely had a toxic dad, right? He worshipped Baal all his life. He worshipped Baal by going and sleeping with prostitutes. That's how Baal was worshipped. She definitely had a toxic life. But just because you had a bad home life doesn't mean you have to be evil, okay? You don't have to be wrong. My dad had a saying as well. He used to say this. He says, you don't have to be what you came from. And I believe the whole gospel of Jesus Christ is probably bound up in those words. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to be what you came from. You don't have to be that way. Why? Because there's a king of glory who paid the price for all your sins and he'll give you a brand new life, won't he? Isn't that precious? Isn't that precious? But Jezebel wasn't willing to hear that. Jezebel believed that good loses. Good always loses because good has to play by the rules and evil doesn't. And folks, that's a lie of the devil, isn't it? To lie of the devil. It leads you to evil. Now listen to this church. And stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. I imagine this man, he's crying out and he said, I didn't blaspheme anyone. I didn't speak against the king. I just told him I couldn't, do, couldn't sell that land. I didn't do this. I would never blaspheme Jehovah. I would never speak evil against his name. And they're dragging him alone. He's carried off to death with his wife watching. Later on in the scriptures it tells us his sons there are dragged out and they are also brought to death. And while his wife is watching all this, they take the stone out and they throw the stone. You know, we read that. They stone the person. We don't get in our mind what's happening there. They take the stone. It busts his knee out and he falls down the ground. Another stone flies through the air. It hits his head. It bursts like a watermelon. But he's still alive, all right? The blood flying down his cheeks. He's crying out, I didn't do this. This is wrong. I didn't do this. His wife left alone. After seeing her family tortured to death, good people that never did anything wrong in that, that place against God, she's left all alone with no one to support her because that was a death sentence within that day. Now, folks, this is evil, isn't it? Amen. And we wonder, why does God allow that to happen? Why does God allow evil things? Why does God allow good people to get hurt? Why does good, God allow good people to pass away? Why does God allow this to happen. Well, look all around you. It's happening all the time, isn't it? 
Hitler marched Jews into ovens, all for one reason, to get what he wanted so he could have control, right? The Taliban, right now, they're hanging people in the streets of Afghanistan to create what they believe is their perfect society, right? That's going on right now. Good people are dying over there right now. And if this was all there was, then we should all rip one another to shreds and fulfill our lust uh, of the hour. And many still do, don't they? Many do all around us. But the thing is, this isn't all there is. Dennis Prager, I don't know if you've heard of him. He has a YouTube channel and a website. He's a very good speaker. He says, without a God who is the source of morality, morality is just a matter of opinion. He goes on to question whether the act of murder is evil by society's standards or by God's standards. Now think about this for a minute. If God hadn't given Moses the Ten Commandments, uh, then who's to say you shouldn't steal from your neighbor or covet your wife? If you don't have the Scripture to tell you what good and evil is, how do you know what good and evil is? You say, I know it by my heart. Well, some people have a different story going on in their minds, all right? He went on to say that without God, defining murder as evil is simply a matter of opinion. Without God in the picture, any criminal act perpetrated against another would not necessarily be wrong, but just a violation of a law established by some society to maintain order. And that's where we are in America today. It's just one problem with all that, with society's conclusion. There is a God, and there is a judgment. Look what it says here. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, what'd he do? He rose up, went to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to go take possession. And he, I can see him just carrying on in there right away. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Now here's our old friend Elijah. He showed up again. He, God tells him to arise, go down to meet Ahab, the king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou sold thyself to work evil. In the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee and will take away thy posterity and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nebar and like the house of Basha the son of Ahijah for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel spake also the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Elijah had never laid down the ultimatum to the king until this day. Some of us don't realize where our sin is leading us. They're going to have horrible deaths, he says. God has declared these people to have horrible deaths. This is the judgment given. And Ahab remembers that Jehovah is merciful in this hour. And if you read on down through it, you'll hear it. He falls down, he fasts, he tears his clothes. He says, oh God, be merciful. I'm so sorry for what I did. And God is merciful. He tells Elijah, he tells him to uh, allow for him not to see the evil in his days. But he will cut off his posterity. He will cut off uh, the men that will take over the throne in later days in his son's time. And three years pass. And Jezebel probably joked. It's been three years. You remember that old crazy prophet? Come around here claiming I'm going to be eaten by dogs. Claiming people's going to lick up your blood. And how stupid you were. Falling down on your face. Crying out to God. Asking for time. But here we still are. How stupid I have of a husband. And Ahab and his son. They'd eat the fruit out of that vineyard. And they say, oh, it's so good. It's so good. Notice, they didn't give it back to the wife, did they? He kept the vineyard. Did he really repent that day when he fell down on his face? Oh, no. You know how many people I've seen over the years fall down on their face, cry out to God, and there ain't a bit of change in them whatsoever. But God is still merciful. He'd give them another day. He'd give them another moment, another time. 
and they eat from that old vineyard. And every once in a while, back in the background, they might hear out the door. They might hear a dog barking. And I can imagine a shiver run up their spine, thinking about what's coming. But very quickly, they'd shove it aside. Shove it aside. There's not going to be a payday someday for us. Isn't that how people look at the judgment? Ahab's blood later on was licked up by the dogs in 1 Kings 22 after he died in battle. His son in 2 Kings 9 is cut off from life and Jezebel finds herself thrown from a window. This guy who's anointed, he comes up, who's going to be the new king. He looks at, his, at her, uh, her servants and says, throw her out the window. He take, they take her and, and after all the years they've had to deal with the old witch, they throw her out the window. And you know what? He went up there and he went up into the castle and he sat down and he said, you know that lady was a king's daughter. You ought to go give her a right barrier in anyway. They run down, they go find her. And you know what they find? They find that the dogs have been gnawing on her bones. They find that all that's left is a skull, two hands, and two feet. Everything else has been eaten by the dogs. Is there going to be a payday? Is what God says going to take place? Yes, it is. The horror of all this. Oh, that's a horrible scene, Scott. That's a terrible scene you described before me today. That's all horrible, right? Here's the worst horror. After that happened, she opened up her eyes and hailed, didn't she? In torment forevermore. That thing and all these deconstructionists want to deconstruct, right? There ain't no hell. My friend, there is a hell. And we better warn people if we love them and we care about them, right? There is a hell. Eternal hell. Eternal judgment of God coming. Hell isn't a fairy tale. When I say good always wins, it does. But evil will lose, right? Hell is real. And good will win. Take one O out of that word good. What do you see? God will win Amen. and he will he will every one of us is going to stand before the judgment seat of God not for what our family did not for what our society did or any other excuse but for what we have done are you ready are you ready for what's coming have you ever imagined what that would be like having the perfect judge stand before you and tell you exactly how it is I imagine some people will get mad. I imagine some people will try to talk back. I really do. I really do. They won't be able to say a word. They'll know every bit of it's true that's been said. Everything coming out of his mouth. But you don't have to get what you deserve. You don't have to. He is merciful. He paid the price for all our sins, didn't he? Do you want to believe again that good always wins here this morning? All you got to do just take a step out of that pew and come down here to this altar and say, God, I want to get started again. I want to renew my belief in you here this morning. I want to understand and remember that even though all these bad things are happening all around me, I've got a God on the throne who's going to bring it all to completion as it should be. My friend, what peace you'll have in your heart. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at Omega Baptist Church.